Hello everyone Hello. and welcome to today's session. What is the future of cybersecurity? I'm Shilpa and I'll be your host for the day. Now we would like to go over a few house rules for our attendees. The session will be in listen only mode and will last for an hour out of which the last 10 minutes will be dedicated to Q&A. If you have any questions during the webinar to organizers or our speakers, use the Q&A window. Also, if you face any audio video challenges, please check your internet connections or you may log out and log in again. An important announcement for a certificate of attendance. Participants need to attend the complete webinar to qualify for the certificate. Also, should fill in the survey form, which will be sent in the attendees thank you email and answer correctly the three multiple choice questions based on the webinar. The certificate of attendance shall be sent to you within the next five to seven working days after the event. Our speakers for today's session, Michael Stindler, a veteran with 27 years of experience in cybersecurity, is an adjunct professor at Collin College in Frisco, Texas, where he teaches the Capstan Security Management course. He also serves as Chief Information Security Officer for Lifelong Medical Care in California. Though he currently focuses most of his energy on community engagement and building a new social engagement company. Michael is the conference director of ISSA North Texas, the tri chair lead for the social transformation domain of Tech Titans, a local community think tank, and a chamber of commerce supporter. He has previously served as the executive director of a non profit focused on helping people establish and develop. Cybersecurity careers. Our second speaker, Tejas Shroff. He is a cybersecurity evangelist. He has led multiple cybersecurity projects and initiatives and is currently senior director of managed security service at NTT Data, where he manages the identity and access management practice. Tejas is also an adjunct professor at the University of Texas at Dallas where he teaches various cybersecurity courses to graduate students at the Jindal School of Management. He is a member of FBI affiliated nonprofit Infagrad National serves on the advisory board for Collins College cybersecurity program and mentors the UTD cybersecurity club. Our third speaker Sunil Vorki. He has over 27 years of security leadership experience with global corporations in the banking, telecommunications, IT enabled services, software and manufacturing sectors. He is currently vice president of global financial services at Postcout and was previously the global head of cybersecurity assessments and testings at HSBC. He also served as Cementex chief technological officer and security strategist for the Middle East. Africa and Eastern Europe and Wipro Limited, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer. Without any further delay, I would now hand over the session to you. Thank you, Shopa. That was an excellent introduction uh, for all of us. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today, very happy to be talking to this group. Uh, my colleagues are incredibly talented and you are all quite lucky to get to hear from them today as well. Uh, and we're going to get to start on uh, just the, the history of cybersecurity and uh, how we've gotten to where we are and, and where we're going. So uh, the, the whole presentation is about what is the future. I'm going to start in the past. So let's take a look. Uh, now, I've been around this planet since 1971. So please understand that what was happening in the 1970s, I was pretty unaware of at the time. What was happening in the 1980s from a cybersecurity perspective, I was also pretty unaware of. I really didn't get into IT until 1995, uh, and along with IT, security aspects of, uh, of IT, IT security. So from a history perspective, the formal education for cybersecurity is really just getting started. So in the 1970s, all IT education, all cyber, and, and cyber being what it was then, securing the, the, the types of equipment and capabilities that existed then was all self-taught. So everybody that had to learn something, you had to figure it out. There were no books, nobody had written anything. You went to a, a, a college, there was no program to learn. It was all self-taught. You had to either be someone that did it in your garage, like a, a Bill Gates, 
uh, or, a, a, you know, Steve Wozniak, those guys were building these big systems that they were going to be the, the future of Apple someday and the future of Microsoft someday. But everybody was doing it on their own. The 1980s come around and now the colleges start to teach programming languages with computer information uh, uh, systems courses. However, there's very little else. There are no IT classes. There are no networking classes. There's no internet to speak of. So we're, we're still pretty far behind. Security still wasn't something that anybody even spoke about. The 90s come around, <laughs> excuse me, and we start to get some certifications. So now we're getting some Microsoft certifications. We're getting some Novell certifications. Uh, generally still IT focused, some application focus, uh, particularly email and the other applications that we start to use at the beginning of the internet. Uh, 1994 rolls around and we get the uh, some of the first security certifications in the industry. So now we're just at the beginning of starting to formalize education uh, in, in cybersecurity in 1994. Uh, and yet the colleges won't come along for quite a while. 2001 rolls, along, uh, rolls around, EC Council is established in 2001, and the Certified Ethical Hacker certification comes out in 2003. That's really the beginning of understanding how to think like a hacker, how to defend against threats, how to be an analyst, and yet still, we don't have a lot of formal education programs in colleges. We do start to get networking, we do start to get IT-related courses, but we're still not thinking a lot about security. Certifications are still driving any type of security education across the entire industry. Around 2010, Colleges start to develop programs and deliver programs as bachelor's degrees and associate degrees. Not a lot of master's degrees yet in, in security at that time. However, it's really IT security. So it, it focuses on the controls, so the firewalls and the intrusion detection, the vulnerability management, the multi, multi-factor authentication comes on a little bit later from a the, the technology exists, but we're not teaching a, a lot yet in 2010, but IT security is the focus. So we're taking IT professionals generally and converting them into security professionals. They've had some work along the way. They've done some work in firewalls that was part of networking. They've done some work in URL filtering and um, other net, uh, intrusion detection. So they have a little bit of experience, some DNS security, et cetera. But we're not really putting new pure security professionals into the world yet. That is, we come out as IT hybrids uh, with a focus on the technology and IT security. Now, around five years later, we started to develop the process aspect of security. So now we're starting into governance, risk, and of course, compliance across the industry is driving a lot of these changes. So you have government uh, driving a lot of these changes. Healthcare is driving a lot of the changes. Finance is driving changes. MasterCard and Visa with the uh, payment card industry is driving a lot of these changes. So compliance and regulatory is driving a lot of the progress. But we're also now starting to see people graduate, that is graduating in 2015 for the first time with a security degree, not an IT degree, but a security degree. Uh, so that, it's getting pretty exciting we're still missing an aspect of the, the security triad though. We've got the technology and now we've got the process, but we're missing the people aspect and we're still not very mature in that. So in 2022, this very year, we're starting to see the initial formation of psychology programs such as cyber psychology, threat actor methods and motivations. We're starting to see college programs include the people aspect of security, not just the technology, not just the governance, risk, compliance, and the processes, but now the, the human aspect as well. Now, I haven't yet seen a people-centric degree program, but the people-based training does exist within an IT security program or within an information assurance program uh, that's process-driven. But the people piece is now starting to get interesting. So now there are cyber psychology classes. You can start to learn how does the hacker think, what are their motivations, et cetera. It's pretty cool. However, what's coming next, at least from the technology perspective, now that we've got our triad put together, we really haven't got our hands wrapped around IoT yet. 
So the Internet of Things, all of the devices that have an IP address that's connected to our network, discovering them, securing them, uh, at least having awareness of them. We still haven't done a really great job of that. Most companies haven't got their hands around uh, that, that concept yet. Cloud has been a, a long transformation for people to figure out what it is, what it is not, how we use one, how we use two, how we integrate them, how we get the performance we need out of them. But now we're really starting to bake security into the cloud as we go. So now we're starting to put security into containers. We're starting to put security into uh, data transfer. So we got CASB, which is a, a what is it, carrier access security broker. Notice I'm missing, I think I have to see you wrong. Uh, maybe if Tejas will help me that up again. Cloud access. access, that's right, cloud access security broker. Um, thank you. Um, AI has been here for a while, but we're starting to do AI from a security perspective, not just from a capabilities perspective. And of course, blockchain is everything. Matter of fact, blockchain will probably be bigger than everything else on this screen combined by the end of this decade. So by 2030, there will probably be more applications being developed around blockchain, will probably be more security uh, being delivered with blockchain. So if you're working on your careers right now, if you can find a blockchain training program, it is an absolutely perfect place to be to get to that next step in your career and the future of cybersecurity. Now this slide looks pretty busy, but I just wanna go back, let's start in the middle, the process, the people, and the technology. So this is our triad, along with uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability that you well, here in every certification program, every training piece you go through, we, are, we need to deal with the process of security, the people aspect of security, and the technology aspect of security. Obviously, on the technology side, we've been doing this for quite a while. We've had controls that we've been delivering for a long time. We've had frameworks that focus on controls for a long time. We, uh, we've gotten pretty good at IT security implementations using best practices from the vendors and the industry. Our IT security operation teams have some experience now, 10, 20 years of experience of delivering security operations. And if you want a job in this area, being a security administrator, being a security engineer, being a security analyst, these are the kind of titles you're going to experience in the technology space. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you in the next slide, engineers are really, really in demand uh, because as we lose the IT focus, we also lose the people that are delivering the technology. We go into this as pure security folks. We're going in as analysts. We're going in as leaders. We're going in as uh, strategists, but we're missing the engineering background. So we're, we're actually short of security engineers in our space. Now, if I go up to the people aspect, you see that little colorful graph up there. It talks about the threat actor, the impacts that they have, the methods they use, who they target, what tools they use, and what their motivations are. Understanding the mindset of a cyber uh, a, a threat actor or a terrorist uh, is very, very valuable in law enforcement, in threat hunting. All of these skills are going to help you understand the people and be really valuable in enterprise security in the near future, if not already. Um, there will be more and more jobs in the people aspect of cybersecurity. Understanding the behavior, understanding the culture of your organization, how you improve the culture to to make it a more security-centric, security-focused culture, and how you motivate uh, your, your internal employees to do the right thing and to understand the motivation of the threat actors and understand what they're doing in your environment. Why are they there? Are they there for money? Are they there to shut you down? Uh, do they have a grudge against you? Is it a nation-state actor? All of these things, understanding the people aspect is gonna become more, it's gonna, it's gonna have the most growth of all of these three over the next 10 years. Now, there is no existing standard. So you cannot go out to NIST and find a standard for how you secure a, from a people perspective. I can go look at NIST and find processes on risk and governance and compliance. I can get help from EC Council on that. I can go to EC Council and NIST and find information on all the technology. There's no standard yet for how we understand the behavior, culture, motivations, threats, tools, methods of the people aspect of security. So once again, that piece is gonna grow more than anything over the next 10 years. On the left side, we'll take a look at the process. So if you want to focus on the process aspect of cybersecurity, there's gonna be your leaders, your architects, those are the roles you're gonna be in in, in that space. If you take a look at that little uh, spreadsheet there, that little table, 
that is uh, actually SABSA. That's the Sherwood Applied Business Security Architecture. It's a framework. Is essentially that just tells you these these are what the the different roles within the organization think about from each different control you deliver, each different program you deliver, the assessments that you build. There's a business view. There's an architect view. There's a designer's view. This is the strategy of delivering cybersecurity. So if you spend time over in this space, you're going to find yourself in a leadership role or an architect role. You're going to be spending time with frameworks and formalized governance, policies, and risk. Uh, I spend time in that space. And I think my two counterparts today spend a lot of time in the space. We three now have gone through our careers, spent a lot of time on the right side in technology. We understand potentially some of the people aspects. But I am not a red team guy, and we'll learn about that on an upcoming slide. So I haven't spent a lot of time in the people space. So I've shifted from the right over to the left. And now I deal with the high level risk and frameworks of an organization and the strategy and, and hire people to do the rest. Now I was talking earlier about red team, purple team, blue team. This is what we think of in general terms as the offensive, defensive and improvement aspects of cybersecurity. So the red team's job is to be an offensive team, whether that is to test our controls internally, or if they work for the government, potentially, to actually attack nation states or other organizations to offset them during war times or conflicts. Uh, so think of red team as offense, blue team as defense, and the purple team's job is to come in and understand both of them, understand where the blue team has deficiencies that the red team has shown and understand how to, to fix it or remediate it, to collaborate with both and improve both. So in your career, you will find that you generally fall into one of these buckets. If you develop skills, you will generally develop skills within one bucket. If you are a defensive minded person helping secure organizations, you will be a blue teamer. If you're a, a, an ethical hacker, you do penetration testing, social engineering, understand uh, code uh, analysis for applications, which is a really valuable skill, or vulnerability exploitation. You're a red teamer. You should spend probably most of your time in one of these buckets. However, if you do end up spending time in both buckets, you naturally fall into the purple team space, where you understand how to defend, you understand how to attack, and you can help both teams improve their capabilities and get to a better security posture for your organization. Now you'll see at the top of the red team, the certified ethical hacker is the certification from EC Council, where you used to start um, your, uh, your, your education with EC Council. Now, however, we actually, I would actually recommend that you go over to the right and look at that CCT, which is a new certification coming out from EC Council. We're actually integrating that with the, at the college level right now with the program of the school I teach at. It's called the Certified uh, Cybersecurity Technician. And if you've heard of the Security Plus, what's that? I thought I heard somebody. If you heard of the Security Plus certification, this is an upgrade from Security Plus. I actually expect this to be the default de facto standard uh, in the near future of certifications because it's Security Plus plus a hands-on validation that you know what you're doing. So it will become more valuable in the industry than the Security Plus has uh, historically. So start with that CCT. And then if you want to go blue team, go over to the Certified Network Defender, which is an EC Council certification. And if you want to focus more on the red team, ethical hacking and penetration testing, move over to the Certified Ethical Hacker. And then there's a Certified Ethical Hacker Master, which is a hands-on component, a very high level uh, certification. Uh, and then in the OSCP, which goes on even later from that to do more red teaming. But right now, from a formalized education perspective, from a certification only, working with EC Council, look at that CCT that's coming out. It's on their website, so it's available now. Then if you want a red team, go over to CEH. If you want a blue team and defense, go over to CND. If you want to do engineering, um, then the focus is probably going to be in networking uh and network defense or network offense so just take a look at the ec council website and see uh what other certifications they have that might go along the the direction you want to go but think of yourself generally as a red team guy offense blue team guy defense or a purple team that has dabbles in both so that you can improve both of them 
if you think about your career in one of these three terms, you will generally find the education path, the uh, titles of the, the of the individuals you want to uh, that you want to possess. Um, you'll understand better the amount of money associated with each, the mobility of each of those jobs. So it can really help you to think of yourself as a red team or a blue team or as a purple team. I spent most of my life on the blue team. I spend a little bit of time. I'm probably about uh, probably about 85% blue and about 15 purple and no red. So I obviously have to hire red uh, teams or red team uh, services uh, to be effective in delivering security. It's not a skill I have, and I, so I have to hire it. I think this is our uh, last slide for my talk today. This is about uh, understanding the jobs that are available in the market. Now, CyberSeq tends to focus on the US. I do believe there's a global aspect to it. This view, however, is the US view right now of job availability for entry level, mid level, and advanced level jobs in cybersecurity. It says it's it's a kind of even mix across entry level. It can it shows you that if you want to start an entry level job, you can go into networking, you can go into software development, you can go into systems engineering, uh, risk analysis, intelligence, IT support. All of these different paths will lead you into cyber careers. Now there are formalized cyber programs. Now you see all of those feeder roles. Every one of those feeder roles is not cyber focused. They all are an external group. Networking is IT. Software development is, in fact, you know, information systems and, and, and coding. Engineering is IT. Risk analysis is you know, more of a, a strategic skill or a leadership skill or an architectural skill. Uh, intelligence is uh, more of an analytics skill, so gathering information, collecting information and analyzing it. And IT support is also an IT skill. So it's interesting that even the websites that tell us how to get into cyber still tell you how to focus on something outside of cyber to get in. But from a formalized education perspective, now there are cyber programs, there are cyber degrees that have a focus or have a capability with some networking, that have some development, that have a little bit of all of this, but they're actually your cyber with a cyber entry level job. So you can actually train to be a cybersecurity specialist, a cyber crime analyst, an intrusion analyst, an IT auditor. You can actually start with all these things, an IT admin, an IT engineer, or a cyber engineer. Um, there are aspects of cyber engineering as entry level jobs. I show you, you'll look over on the right and you'll see that big green ball that shows that there are a lot of advanced level jobs for cybersecurity engineers. There are IT engineer entry level jobs or cyber engineer entry level jobs. There are Generally, however, you start as an IT engineer or an IT administrator or a cyber administrator and work yourself up to that advanced level job. But look at that middle tier. Look how the, there, there's just growth and growth and growth. Now, you see that cybersecurity analyst? That's a blue teamer with a little bit of purple in there. Then you got your consultant, which can go all over the place. But that is a great, great place to start your career. Working with a company as a... Uh, um, <clears throat> our panelists uh, have today, uh, we've all worked with Wipro, which is a, a company you have access to, as well as uh, there are numerous competitors out there. But working as a consultant in that space, you can get a lot of different skills developed. There are a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of job availability, and you can work yourself into an analyst role or a penetration tester role. So definitely take a look at something like CyberSeq to figure out what careers are blowing up, where there's a lot of space for growth, Right now, you take a look on the right and you say, my goodness, there are a lot of jobs out there for cybersecurity engineers. I bet that's going to be, uh, there's going to be some money there in, in the future. And there, there absolutely is. We actually have quite a, uh, quite a shortfall on the number of uh, engineers that are available in this space. They tend to be on the IT side. So when we get into deploying security apps with best uh, practices, uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of people that have that capability. So definitely think about that. And with that, I am uh, going to turn it over uh, to, um, who am I turn it over? Te Tejas? Tejas, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And uh, we'll get some, uh, if you guys have questions, make sure you put them in chat. And then we'll get to the question answers at the end. But uh, Tejas, it's all yours. Thanks, Michael, for a great introduction and overview. So, and thanks everyone uh, for attending this. Uh, this is just a single slider that I've put together. It's more like a word cloud. These days, everything has a word cloud. I wanted to highlight some of the buzzwords 
of cybersecurity that you are hearing. But before that, before I go there, I'll ask with a, a question to build on what the story Michael said from where we were in the 70s to where the world has evolved. Um, one thing that I've noticed is earlier people used to uh, only involve or in, only invest in two things when there was some some fear. One is in God and one is in cybersecurity. You would pray when you were in trouble. You okay. You would pray when you were in trouble and you would do the cybersecurity measures just when you feared that you would be hacked or there would be some problems. The slide has gone. You can actually continue, Tejas. Yeah. Sorry about that. I made I Tejas the presenter and the slide went away. Tejas, do you want to make me the presenter again? I didn't realize when it, it, it did that, that it would take the screen away. No, that that's okay. I think I, I can speak without the slide. So uh, okay. we'll be sharing the slide. So one of the biggest thing was that fear aspect was what dri was driving cybersecurity. Now the things have changed. Like a proverbial backbencher who nobody notices in a class was what cybersecurity was. Now, all of a sudden, over the proliferation of different channels, all those things which has happened over the years, uh, the different developments, as Michael said, in the mid, in the early 90s, the internet came along, then came the smartphone, all those things, and cybersecurity was thrust in the middle. And when it was thrust in the middle, all of a sudden, it is in the spotlight. All the spotlight is now falling on cybersecurity. But what we want to say is earlier people started off working on cybersecurity as information security, protecting their network, protecting their operating systems. But now cybersecurity is a lot beyond that. If you look at the safety aspect, if you look at the privacy aspect, all that rolls into the compliance in Europe and everywhere. It's all about compliance with GDPR, with privacy aspect, with safety, security, global threats, all those things are rolling into cybersecurity. More so when you add IoT, more so when you, when Michael talked about something called as blockchain, which is the biggest building block for metaverse, which is coming down the pipe. So all those things are gonna lead into the future of cybersecurity, which is many fold bigger than what we are seeing right now. And for that, you need to, continuously update yourself because it's a moving target. So you have to update yourselves with the right technology, with the right education. You, you cannot learn on the go. We've all been in the cybersecurity for years. We all learned to crawl, walk and run at the same time. But now we need to start augmenting it because for the first time, there are more and more courses which are available, both on the business end and in the technical end. And Michael mentioned with the three uh, three pillar approach with people, process, and technology, and where people aspect is needed. This is a unique solution is cybersecurity because you're adding a technology guys, but at the same time they are reading through the policies and they are trying to map the policies, what is written in the policies to the technology aspect. So that's why it is critical that we learn it the right way. But I think at this point, I'll uh, hand it over to Sunil because I don't want to go on and on because with all of us, we can all go on and on on this topic. No, great insight, uh, both by Michael and Tejas. Uh, I have a questions actually uh, to understand further from your experience also. When we all started our career, the assumption that time or the, or the norm that time was that you spend considerable number of years as a system administrators, a networking guy or an operating system guy, and then move into security based on the foundation you have built. But currently, if you look at, we are seeing the youngsters straight out of the college coming into security. So what has changed? Is it that the formal educations were not available, so the only way to acquire the knowledge was the job experiences? Or how, how, do you, how, how do you see that change? Because I personally spent five years as a sister administrator uh, in Unix and Novel in a bank in Saudi Arabia before getting into security. 
Okay, so what's your will? Let me start, uh, ask the first question to Michael and then Tejas, see if you can add to that. You are speaking on mute. Thank you so much. So I, I did the same thing, Sumil. I, I started my career in, in IT. I started with desktop support and then moved into email support and then networking. And then with networking came firewalls, with firewalls came IDS, with IDS came all of those skills. And I, and I became an, an admin and did all of the storage, all of the networking, all of the web servers, all of the everything. And I just had a very broad skill set. And then as I developed that broad IT skill set, I needed to learn how to secure each one of those controls um, or each one of those capabilities of the organization. And I just got a, a very broad experience in securing servers, securing applications, securing networking devices. And it just worked out that I realized at some point that I was more strategic and more process and people oriented than I, than I had an interest in technology. And so I moved into leadership and I think, uh, that's a that's a great way to go over time. We don't know if that path will work for the next 30 years like it did for me in the last 30 years, but it's a pretty good guess uh, that you can move into an IT role and expand into a security role. But you actually have the opportunity, uh, students these days, to start in security roles, to start as analysts, to start as SOC um, team members, uh, security operations center team members, and, and then spend 30 years in security, you, you would have you know, 15, 20 more years of pure security than I would. However, uh, if you skip the step of understanding networking, if you skip the steps of understanding network operating systems and access control, you really miss out on fundamental skills of security. So I am, as much as I am excited for the future of students to be pure security professionals, if they lose or don't have access to some of those IT skills or development skills, I, I, I'm actually concerned that they might not be as effective security professionals in their careers. Tejas, what do you think? I, I tend to agree, Michael, because uh, as you rightly said, they need to have those fundamentals. So they need to start at floor zero, at least in some capacity. Um, and yes, the times have changed. Uh, Sunil, to your point, uh, when we were all growing up, we probably didn't have the option of going straight into security because security still entered through network at that point. Now the security has different careers which are ahead of these uh, generation and absolutely they should go into that. But as Michael said, they need to have somehow catch up on the fundamentals of what the network is, why the need means a lot of times we people start getting straight into the solutioning and they don't understand what are the underlying principles why do you need to protect it means yes threats is one thing but you need to first understand the core basics which is your uh, perimeter and the network so but are there uh, so when we started uh, I, I used to go on we on late hours uh, with floppy disk to update the antiviruses Okay, that, that was an era in 90s we came from. But there was no way to do an education or acquire knowledge because there was no certifications, no trainings, nothing available. Currently, if you look at from starting from uh, the schooling side and then to the colleges, there are specialist kids coming with engineering with security or MCA with security, all of this combinations with security understanding and EC council type of companies are also offering certification. So aren't they learning the foundation or the fundamentals of security before coming in. So is that the reason we are seeing a shift right now? Because one of the problems I have found is if a person spends five years, six years in IT or in a network side, when he starts his career fresh in cybersecurity, the question is that, is the cybersecurity going to consider him as a five-year experience security guy coming in or is he competing with a fresher with the certifications coming in? What do you think that change? So I can take that first. And I would say is there are uh, the critical part, as as you, know, you rightly said, there are college education available. There are companies like EC Council, but there are also there are a lot of other companies which have come up. They are all offering certifications. So it is critical that people look at what is good, what works, uh, a reputed name like EC Council and a couple of others 
is fine. But if you go after any certification which do not have the credentials or so, then they may end up on the wrong path. So obviously the universities are going to be good, but you can only offer so much because security, cybersecurity is a very broad brush. And a lot of times if you do a major, you have four courses and four courses just touch the surface. So if somebody is trying to start their career, they want to get deeper knowledge and that's where they might tend to miss out just by doing one course and getting straight into the security. So this is a process of continuous learning. This is a process of continuously augmenting themselves because what worked today is not going to work tomorrow. It's a moving target. It's a continuous evolution of threats and the different channels, different threats are being added. So if you if you rest on your laurels and you thought that I'm done, I've secured everything, you may be wrong. So um, Michael, your points. I'm going to give you guys some some wisdom right here. So if you've got pieces of paper and you've got pencils, write this down. This 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 is this is going to serve you your whole career. This is the point where you should take notes. Number one, when I hire an individual, I start with character. Does the person have the ethics, the morals, and the other strengths of character that I want on my team? If you don't have that, I don't care about anything else that you have. After that, I want accountability. Is the person going to do what needs to be done regardless of me telling them, regardless of me babysitting, regardless of me having to give direction? Are they a self-starter? Do they understand the, the needs of the business, the needs of the team, and will they get it done without me? So those two things first. Number three, I want passion. Do you care about what we do, our business model, what we do as security professionals or as IT professionals? If you love what we do, I am a security geek. I geek out. I can talk to my peers. We can talk about this stuff ad infinitum. We don't fit in every day in the business world. We don't fit in with the sales guys all the time. We don't fit in with the executives all the time. We don't fit in with the um, marketing team, but we fit in with each other. We are cyber geeks and IT geeks, and we love the stuff. We speak a different language than they do, and we love each other. And if you're one of those guys, I can see it. I'll be, and I mentioned hiring you. Number four, your experience, your capability is the next thing, the fourth thing I look at. So if you don't have strong character, if you're not accountable, and you're not passionate about what we do, I don't care how good you are at what you do. I just don't, I'm not even, I'm not even gonna look at you. But if you have those other three and you have a strong experience, I'm gonna hire. Fifth, I'm going to look at education. So the last thing I look at is your certifications and your uh, formal education, but they are a qualifier for you to compete with everybody else. So all else being equal, if everybody has good character, everybody's accountable, everybody that I'm looking at has passion and they have good experience, then I'm gonna go, this guy has chased down some certifications. He's a self-starter, he's, he's trying to drive his career and I, I think he'll keep doing that or she'll keep doing that and there's value. Or that person has worked on their degree and finished a degree and is working on a master's or something like that. That's a, that's a differentiator in being competitive. But take those at least those first four things and every job you go into from now on, regardless of whether the interviewer asks you questions, make sure you leave a mark in their mind that you are a person of strong character, that you are accountable and a self-starter and will get things done. And, and if you can prove that you've already done it, make sure you have that on your resume and can speak to it. Make sure that you demonstrate how passionate you are about IT or security. Be excited about what we do. And lastly, have some experience, show some anecdotal information about how you've touched something, how you've installed something, how you've managed something, how you've made the team, the company, the solutions better. How you started here and made it, uh, you know, you started at five and you got it to nine. You don't have to get it to 10. We're not looking for perfection, but we are definitely looking for team members that turn our current state into a desired state. There's my how I would respond to Sunil. Sunil, yeah. can I add one more quick point yes. here? Yes. Yeah. What I would also say is for the, um, the generation that is trying to get into or the generation that may already be in cybersecurity would confirm this is this is not the most glamorous job. You're not, you're a lot of times questioning um, 
because you would always get a pushback from people who are working on the user experience side. Like by putting security, you are defeating user experience. But you you also have to be strong in multiple ways. There's a word called resilient that we say, but there is also strong to understand that for security, you are ready to compromise and uh, cut down on user experience. Uh, sometimes it may not, it may be adding some extra controls as both Sunil and Michael have been saying, but that is only to make your system stronger. So that's the mindset you have to take. And that's why I said security, being in a security is a mindset. Sorry, Sunil, go ahead. No, no, that's a, it's like in what I'll, I'll also come with a question on that. So before that, in the healthcare industry, we see uh, specialist and generalist. In the same way, in security domains also, we see a lot of, uh, because in normal IT, you don't see that much, but in, in security, we see the generalist and the, uh, and the specialists. How do you look at this? And because in my career, when I started at some point, I understood I don't have the skill set or the patience to become a specialist. So I went a journalist route. Um, so what, what's your uh, feeling about it? Michael, Michael, you Michael do you want to take that? Just please, yeah. Okay, I can take it. So as I said, security uh, paints a pretty broad brush. So there are lots of aspects. There's a lot of breadth that you can acquire. And when you use the word generalist or specialist, I would kind of classify them with a different way of looking at this. A generalist is somebody who has more breadth and a specialist is someone who has more depth. So typically when you start your career, you would start in a narrower focus. You would start as a specialist. You try to start getting acquired knowledge in a particular domain. But as you grow, you start acquiring knowledge about other domains. So which is what soon some people like to stay as specialists and they like to go deeper and deeper into what they are doing, but they don't want to expand their um, horizontal horizon as compared to there are people who would like to just stay on to the broad side of things and not get deeper into everything. So that's that's why the difference is and I, I feel that Security offers you both the options so people can select what they want. Got it. Michael? Yeah, yeah Tejas is exactly right. There are external factors and there are internal factors. The external factor is that the generalist generally has access to more opportunities. As jobs become available, because you have a broad range of skills, you have the potential of, of applying for and winning multiple jobs as a specialist with only one or two skills you can't apply for all of those jobs but you can there is opportunities to make more money as a specialist those are the external factors the internal factors i think they just just kind of addressed that is you your personality matters if you like chasing something to the end of the to, to the end of the line you can be a specialist if you want to go, man, I want to be the master of pen testing. I want to be the master of vulnerability management. I want to be the master of, you know, code analysis. Great. I can't. I don't have the ability to stay focused in one thing. I would get bored. I have, and I also have a, a kind of a trait I call fear of missing out. I want to know everything and everyone and be everyone. I want to experience everything. So generalism for me makes a lot of sense. I want to understand the pen tester and I want to understand the risk uh, analyst and I want to understand the admin and I want to understand the engineer. I want to, I want to understand everybody's job and do, and I have. I've had everybody's job. I've done every IT job. I've done every network job. I've done every uh, application job short of coding. I don't do coding. Um, I, I've done all, all the leadership jobs. I've led infrastructure. I've led storage. I've led security. I've led uh, you know all, all kinds of different teams. Uh, and been an admin, been an engineer, been a consultant, been a trainer, been a uh, on an, a, a teacher, a uh, professor. So if you like being everyone experiencing everything like I do, a generalist makes sense from an internal factor perspective. But generally think of generalists as having the most opportunities for the most potential jobs, but the specialist as having the most potential uh, earning capability or opportunity. Right now, if you are a uh, data scientist, so you can't do firewalls and you can't do antivirus and you can't 
lead, but you're a data scientist, you can, in the United States, you can go make three or $400,000 a year as a data scientist, as a specialized skill. If you, if you add security to your ability to analyze uh, that, so now I can go help insurance companies understand the threats that are impacting all of their customers, help them write policies or um, um, premiums to actually uh, insure companies from a cyber threat perspective. You're a hyper specialist, but you have, I mean, you can just almost write your check. You can almost have a blank check from a company from insurance industry right now if you have that skill because so few people do and it's so badly needed. That's my that's my response to that, you know. So one approach is start as a specialist and then build your career because earlier Thesis also mentioned that then you will be coming with three or four domains studied from academics and then you add up continuously learn and then move into a generalist side of it. Now, another question uh, based on all of our journeys also. Cybersecurity field, if you look at compared to uh, if you're a software developer, once you are a software developer, lifelong, you are a, an expert in software development. In cybersecurity, you need a continuous learning. You continuously get pushbacks. You get burned out. OK, we are literally playing Tom and Jerry game many a times. In my career, I have seen when you are sitting in a SOC and all of that thing, you are sometimes in advantage position. You are in disadvantage position. Your uh, work-life balance is messed up. You cannot meet up many commitments because of the field you are in cybersecurity. Now, now you also mentioned that safety is becoming. Earlier we mentioned about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now safety is coming into picture and the responsibility of cyber because of OT and IoT uh, coming into picture. Now, why did? So what is the trigger or the spark or? or keep the people or uh, or look at the people and come back and say that i am i want to join security and and be there because if you're a software developer and when you are publishing your code you feel an achievement saying that you've done something that is there in production in our world many times we don't even can say what happened on that day because it would have been a tough day mood swings everything so what do you think is is or, or let you start with saying that michael why did you choose cyber as a as a subdomain uh, I would say cyber chose me and it, it, an opportunity came up for me to teach and I've always wanted to teach. And that's, that's kind of where it really started for me. But I would say if I were to be at the point in the career, these folks are, um, I don't want to ignore the obvious and the obvious is money. Uh, and as much as you can enjoy your career, it's a job and you should not work to live. The reason you get into security or IT is because it is a growing field it will be for the foreseeable future there is a way to make excellent money to be in the middle class or above and to secure your family's financial future I, we can't ignore that elephant in the room it and security professionals make excellent incomes they have great job mobility they're in great demand uh, and it's going to continue that way for some time once you're in and you're among that group and you're making this money, your family's secure. How do you stay interested uh, at that point? Depends once again on internal factors. Are you a person that wants to understand everything, be everyone, do every job and go out there and, and switch from job to job every two or three years? Or are you the one that says, I'm going to dedicate my life to this, this cause, this company? Um, it's really, I think there are just too many variables of our internal personalities. Uh, for it to be a universal answer to that question. Thank you. I, 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 know, I know, I know we are coming up on time, so I'll quickly add and I'll add a little bit of a different perspective. Yes, obviously money is there, the stability is great. But the other thing I would say is also goes back to original thing, which we've been saying along is passion. Means we look at people like first responders, the people who are like the policemen or the firefighters in any city, anywhere. They, they may not be the most highly paid, but they are passionate about things, what they do. Like Sunil, you said, the work-life balance and everything, right? We, we look at the people who are in the process of defending, be it military, be it, um, uh, be it uh, police, be it firefighters. They are the ones who are always there in crisis and they, they are available. So they get the respect, they get the thrill out of protecting and keeping everything safe and secure. And I think it also requires that mindset that you are just in there 
uh, to get the money, then you might move on. But if you are in there to possibly build something, maybe you get thrilled out of thwarting a cyber attack and you could be the one who can get the challenge out of that, that I've protected, I've made a, a cyber attack from a APT somewhere in the world and I've made that unsuccessful and that's my challenge. Yes, then you are in the right track. So. I used to think sometimes saying that, why why did I choose security? Was it a nine to five job was a better one? But I always what I felt is that I loved the dynamic nature of this domain and the kick of the firefighting uh, and, and the decisions you need to do in a split of a, a very short time. Uh, so that helped out. And like Michael also mentioned earlier, understanding a vast domains around us, saying that how it is changing. Wow, the cause and effect, something happening in somewhere in the world and how it is going to impact us. Because earlier when we, in the 90s, we hear about a virus which is propagating in the US, it takes months to reach to our region because the propagation was not faster. Now it is seconds or immediately you see the impact happening here. So those are the complexity which, which made me live here. Uh, on, on that um, as you mentioned the time uh, is you want to add something on that please no, no no i was saying that maybe we need to probably open up for questions yes so maybe shilpa Shil can do that shilpa any questions on this yeah thank you thank you very much for an informative session and our attendees say the same sentiments uh if you are interested to learn more about our programs do let us know in the poll that's going to be conducted now let us know your preferred mode of training and we will reach out to you soon. So, shall, shall we start with the Q&A? Yes, please, Shilpa. If there are questions, please let us know. Yeah. So, our first question is from uh, Anirban. Uh, it's for Michael. For cybersecurity audit, which certification we need to go for? Is it ISO 27001 LA or CISA? <laughs> Which certification should you go for first? Is that the question? For the audit. For yeah. audit? Boy, um, it, it, would be, it would be hard to argue that the CISA is not generally ex considered the most valuable audit certification in our industry with C-RISC, C-R-I-S-C, probably uh, right in there with it. Those are probably the two most recognized. Would you both agree? I so, would. My, my personally, what I done is that I done the ISO, I done the CISA uh, for the methodology uh, and GSNA from SANS for the technical aspect of it. And then the CR, C risk and C, uh, CGIT just to understand the, the overall perspective to that. Uh, I, do, I do feel as though that once you go into a particular group, so if you go with EC Council, you go with SANS, you go, with, it, it, it behooves you to stay in that because the the learning methodologies and the testing methodologies become pretty similar. So if you go get your CCT and then your CEH, your C, you know, eventually your CCSO, right? All of these, the learnings in one place, it's it's easier to understand where to get resources, where to get training. So I do recommend, uh, you know, spending time, go spend time with EC Council. They have a, not only do they have a lot of certifications and a lot of value now, they're constantly growing that and they're going to be the largest uh, education provider for cybersecurity in the world. Um, are you, uh, Shilpa, is, is, Shilpa is, is, is that already the case? Are you guys first or uh, second right now? Shilpa? Also to add to that thing, what I have found is that more, many technical guys face a problem when they are appearing for an audit exam. The reason is the mindset. The technical guys are always into availability but uh, the auditors don't care about that or their priority is integrity and confidentiality integrity. so that mindset when i am writing the exam was something which was was, was much required yeah Back well to. said i think that the, the two, two biggest mindset changes from an it professional to a security professional and then a security professional to an auditor uh, we go from reactive to proactive and then from proactive security focusing on availability, like an IT security professional would deliver, to an, an information security or a risk-driven strategic role. Those are your changes. So as you 
if you were to start in IT like we did, we started in reactive jobs. We did what the company needed. We, we built the applications they needed on demand, and we were always reactive to our job. When we became security professionals, you have to become proactive. You have to know what you have to do every day and do it. On you know, look at the logs, look at the queues, look at the whatever. We become proactive. That's the primary difference between IT and security. And then when you go to a risk-based certification, a risk-based program, you move from the availability aspect that Sunil said to the other aspects, whether it's uh, um, confidentiality, integrity, safety, uh, non-repudiation, all these these aspects. I, I agree completely. Yeah. Chilpa, maybe Chilpa. we can move to the next question. Thank you so much for answering that question. Our next question is by Rohit. With certification, should a computer science engineer fresher take to work in cybersecurity? Is it CEH, CCP, or CNS? Michael, do you want to answer? All of them. <laughs> um, the answer is just I have I have seventy I have seventy two certifications. Wow. Uh, why stop? Education is is education. Just go get it. Um, there, if you're asking which one should you have first, the one the person that's interviewing you wants you to have. There is no other answer to that. Um, the one you care about, the things you want to learn, is the second best answer. But other than that, just go get them all. They're just sitting there. It's just free knowledge waiting for. Well, let's talk about free. It's just knowledge sitting there for you to go get. Um, and just add them to your resume. That's what I did forever. I just kept adding certifications. Why? Because I didn't have access to formal degrees that led value to what I was trying to do. So I just chose all the certifications. Um, also, I trained everything. So I had to go get certified in everything I trained. But um, the, the CCT that's coming out is going to be, I expect in the next five years, the CCT to replace Security Plus as the de facto certification for getting into our industry. Um, now, I'm waiting for EC Council to come up with something equitable to the CISSP. The CISSP is the mid-range uh, primary certification. EC Council really needs to come up with something to compete with in that space. But now when you go to the top end again, um, EC Council has a very good certification at the as in the CCSO and OSCP and these other pieces. So uh, I, I think EC Council starting, stay with EC Council, and you won't be wrong. Um, there's plenty of else out, plenty else out there. Go do all of it. There's my answer. Michael, I need an autograph uh, from your side when I meet. I have never seen a person in my career with 72 certificates. So surely next time when I meet, I will be asking for that. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> Shilpa. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael, for answering that question. Our next question is by Nikhil. Uh, I want to be an ethical hacker. What should I do after completing my undergraduation? Consult. Go go find it. Go find a managed service provider or a managed security service provider that either is already offering hacking uh, uh, red teaming services, uh, ethical hacking services, or uh, wants to, and go do consulting. Ab absolutely, the pen testing space. The primary delivery methodology is external, third party. It's not not very many companies have a red team until you get to the Fortune 500 or 100 in the U.S. Um, so definitely think about go work for a consulting company. And and Nikhil, other thing I would add is um, you also have to think how would people protect it. So if you are approaching of hacking hacking into it, then you need to know what are the measures that somebody would have taken. To protect it because you are supposed to be breaking through those measures so you prepare yourselves for a career so that you you know how to break into what's being protected and i usually i usually make a joke that there are a lot of careers in not being ethical hackers i'm just not sure how well it would fall on this audience um but <laughs> there are a lot, there are a lot more careers in being a bad hacker uh, an unethical hacker than there are being an ethical hacker. However, there's a great downside to being an unethical hacker. It's called prison. Shilpa? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very so much for answering that question. Uh, next question is by Ami. Can you discuss more on the expected impact of blockchain on cybersecurity in this decade? Yes. 
I'd rather give you a link. I'll let you guys talk about that while I go find them a link. No, Michael, you can do it. You are the expert on that part. So think of blockchain as uh, it's nothing but a trusted register of events that have occurred. And that is, we can no longer, it's a non-repudiation piece. It's, it, you cannot deny that a transaction has occurred, that a sale has occurred, that ownership exists. It's, it, it's proof that you own an NFT. It's proof that you own a home. It's proof that a transaction has occurred. Well, that's what security is about. Security is about integrity of data, integrity of facts, and non-repudiation of transactions. As we cannot deny that we were that the transaction occurred, that we sold something, bought something, uh, did something. Well, blockchain is literally a security tool. It is literally uh, non-repudiation and integrity. So it, it falls directly in line with one of our primary deliverables as security professionals. So everything we do, every single tool in use today, cybersecurity tool, ID tool in the world, will shift to a blockchain-based based integrity mechanism. And that is, there will be a distributed register or record of all transactions uh, that cannot be denied and cannot be undone and uh, is not owned by a particular entity. So it's, it's, it's going to be fantastical. It will think of it as if every application in the world were to change with one technology, would you like to know that one technology that's programming ling language um, neutral? It doesn't care what you programmed it in. It doesn't care what um, system type or OS it's running on. It doesn't care where in the world it is. Every single application known to man that does logging will switch to blockchain as its distributed register. Um, would you like to know that technology? I think it behooves you to do so. Michael, uh, we have seen a lot of attacks from the starting with availability attacks and then in the more, now very prominent is confidentiality attacks. Do you see integrity attacks uh, in a rising which will trigger the need for every organization to look at blockchain? Uh, organizations, now what I just said, organizations will not need to look at blockchain. It will, it will come in the package. So don't think of this as an individual group or organization that will have to solve this themselves. Uh, Sunil, you, are, you don't count for that answer because you work for a company that will. Um, if you work for a security company that delivers products like Sunil does, Forescout will have to deal with blockchain. Their customers won't because Forescout will do it for them. Um, I, don't think it's, I don't think blockchain is going to be a solution that individual companies need to address, but everybody that de develops applications will. Shilpa. Thank you for answering that question. Our next question is by Nitin. Nowadays, a lot of people are certified, but when we onboard for actual job, most of people unable to perform the basic stuff also, which impact overall work and sometimes need to release resource due to performance issue in short time. How to deal with this knowledge gap and today's generation working mentality? So if I can add to that, see, yeah, uh, I, I also have this concern on that. Many of a time, the certifications are taken with short. Okay, that is impacting a lot of things because it is bring the reputation issue for that certification certifying companies for the individuals. While certificates are 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 is quite required. Uh, the companies should also evaluate them while recruiting on the adequacy of the knowledge they have on it. Okay, you yep. just don't rely on the paper. But from an individual perspective, we should look at certification as learning, not gathering that certificate alone. That, that's my view, Michael. It's exactly what I said earlier. If, if you're hiring people out of order, that is, if you're not hiring for character and then accountability and then passion and then capability proven experience and lastly education you're going to get into the, the position you're in that is if companies hire people because they have a certification that's that's a, a an improper process 
the value of a certification and a, an education is to put it on a resume to tell me what you're trying to do with your life and what effort you've made so that you can be interviewed. The interview is for me to determine if you have the character, accountability, passion, and truly the capability. I'm supposed to interview you and confirm that you know what you're supposed to do, not that you've read a book, not that you've passed a test, but that you know day to day, what are, your, what are your tasks day to day for this job? What are your tasks week to week, month to month, quarter to quarter? Do you know how to proactively look at a log? How do you do, how do, you do incident response? How do you um, deliver a, a server? How do you build one? How do you administer one? What are some best practices? What are some gotchas? My job is to, if, if you have people at your job that aren't doing a good job, uh, it has nothing to do with them. It has to do with the, the people that interviewed them didn't filter them right. Yeah, and I'll add one more thing to that, Nitin. Um, people who are coming fresh out of college, they may be able to pass the certification exam much faster because they're used to reading and memorizing and sometimes they can pass the exam. But like, that's why you need to see when somebody has just graduated and walks away with a CISSP, then I, as a hiring manager, would never hire that person because CISSP, what it takes somebody to spend five, six years in the industry minimum before you can even go for that certification. And just because you pass the certification doesn't mean you know the, the body of knowledge. There is another side also we are seeing. Currently, if you look at attritions are shooting up in the cybersecurity field also. Because every jump, you are getting a considerable increment. At yep. some point of time, you are reaching an extraordinary amount against the, the, the service or the renew, the company's return of investment on that service. At that point of time, if you are really not competitive, you are going to get into trouble. That is why you need to make sure that you are justified for that, uh, that, that role by continuously learning uh, all, 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 all those subjects very well. Because otherwise, it is a hype running at some point of time. This this uh, deck is going to collapse. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I expect from my teams for everything we deliver, for every security function, control, assessment, program, whatever that we deliver. I expect there to be governance. That is something that tells me what the business needs are and what the success criteria are for that individual function. I want implementation of those controls according to industry or best or industry or vendor best practices. And I want to sh I want demonstrated to me that that was done. I want metrics and regular validation of the effectiveness of that control to prove that we're doing our job uh, correctly. And I want visibility, whether that's through reports or some other mechanism uh, to the leadership team that they can be aware of the effectiveness that we're measuring on a regular basis. I measure everything we do along those four criteria. Do we align with the business? Do we have the governance in place? Have we implemented according to best practices? Do we validate according to specific metrics uh, on a regular basis? And we provide visibility to our leadership team. If we do those four things, every one of those things is successful. If you do that as a professional, then you will be supporting your leadership team who will be supporting the business and everyone will be happy. Shilpa. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, next question is for nonprofit organization, what kind of initial cybersecurity need to be implemented internal? Some bullet points on that. Whether it is a nonprofit or, or a profit or any industry, if you have a connected device and if you have information within, you are a target and you have, have compliance requirement, regulatory requirement. So I don't think it changes between the industry whether you, or what adequacy you need to do that based on the risk appetite you have, your commitment to your stakeholders. You need to ensure that the relevant security is in place. Yeah, nonprofits have little more responsibility, especially because they have to protect not that the for-profits don't have to, but non-profit even more so because sometimes they don't have the, the means in terms of the people available to do the protection of data, especially about the donor data, be it their 
PII information, be it their payment information, and they need to at least ensure that whatever that information they are receiving is not being made public and that is being protected even more so because that's how nonprofits do not want to lose the credibility because there are so many nonprofits out there. And if they are the ones who are letting that data slip through, then they'll lose the credibility. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna be prescriptive here. If you're a small company or a startup, which nonprofits often are, if you do nothing else, if no other company, I mean, every company in the world, if you do nothing else, do five things. If you, if you can get nothing right, if you have no staff and you have no money, from a security perspective, do five things. One, multi-factor authentication. Two, antivirus. Three, backup and restoration procedures so that you can recover if you are compromised. That is not as easy uh, done as said. People generally get their backup and restoration. They don't test it. There's a lot of pitfalls there. Four, security awareness training, phishing simulation, uh, if you're big enough, at least security awareness training. Make sure your employees keep security top of mind. Five, vulnerability uh, assessments or management and patching. Do those five things. If you do nothing else in security, if you build no policies, if you build no programs, if you have no maturity, do those five things well, and there's a greater likelihood that you will not be impacted by compromise uh, than anything else you could do. Shilpa. Thank you for answering that question, Michael. Uh, next question is, what knowledge is required to understand and implement cloud security? <laughs> uh, everything. Would we agree? You guys agree? Everything. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very broad question. It's cloud security is is no different than on-prem security. It's all of it plus the cloud security aspects. So you have to understand everything you would have understood on-prem, and then you have to understand what the shared responsibility model is, what the difference between SaaS and PaaS and IaaS, uh, platform as service, infrastructure as a service, what those differences are, what responsibilities you have to secure those environments, data in motion, data at rest, data in processing, um, what capabilities you have for restoration. There's just so much. The answer to that is everything. You have to know everything. Cloud and, and, is not yeah. more secure. It's it's only as secure as you understand your shared responsibility. And and add to that the the whole compliance and the contracts framework which comes into play, oh, yeah. days, especially where where the servers need to be keeping your data and all that. So I think it's it's a broad question. It's like how do you protect the world? And yeah, protect the world requires everything. So that's what you have to do. <laughs> They just got it. How do you protect the world? Yeah, that's, that's all you need to know. But it is a good, is it's a very upcoming, very strong field to specialize in uh, yes. because there is a lot of uncertain ambiguities, the uh, gray areas, uh, and the world needs uh, the right candidates on that. It is a, it's a very good field. Shilpa. But just, just, just the configuration of an Azure environment. And the configuration then of Intune and the configuration of conditional access and the config. I mean, it's it's its own skill set. You can specialize in a particular platform's security configuration, and that is a whole job. And yet you know nothing else of the rest of of, of security, and you'd still be one of the most valuable people in the industry. Yeah, Shilpa. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'll take the last question. Would cybersecurity careers be limited to only computer science majors or can it be expanded to other majors pursuing college degrees? My Okay, uh, I'll just start with it. My understanding, it doesn't matter what your uh, the academic background is because like Michael and Therges mentioned earlier, psychologist. My In one of my organizations, my boss was a psychologist. Um, so, it, it, and if uh, I have worked with lawyers, I have worked with uh, auditors, uh, the chartered accountants, uh, uh, the people from law enforcement, uh, from different uh, and uh, um, services. So, uh, I have seen people from different. Everybody has a space in security, because it's it's, it's a, such a broad space. Tejas and Michael, uh, I would go ahead and 
echo to what Sunil just said, and I would actually uh, go on record and say that it is a complete myth that cybersecurity only works for computer science or for that matter, information systems. Actually, if there is any technology oriented field that can work for any majors, it is cybersecurity. Because as we discussed earlier, you need people who can write policies, who can who write, who can understand risk, who can do the audit. You all would agree that sometimes maybe the computer science guys may not be the best, and I'm a computer science guy myself. So I would say that we are not the best when it comes to writing policies. But yeah. there are people you need who can write um, the correct policy statements, who can write the correct risk statements, because cybersecurity has as much of a business facing work as it is the technology facing work. And that's where people can understand that this this thing is, it, it's like, how do you protect yourself? How do you protect your family? And uh, do you need a police to come and protect you every day? Everyone has their own responsibility. And that's where we sometimes miss the point. Sorry, Sunil, you've been trying to say something. It's an orchestra of multidiscipline. Exactly. Exactly. And I think if people understand that everyone can be in cybersecurity in a different capacity, not everyone can expect those big dollars that probably what Michael was talking about, but you can even get there. Uh, you just have to approach it in the right manner with right uh, education, right mindset, and that will get you there. So don't, don't get caught up if you are a particular major. There are opportunities. Seek out some mentors, if you will, and that should help you in your career ahead. Michael? I'll give you a little different point of view here. Um, the function of a degree is to open doors. The function of a degree is for you to be able to apply to a job. The degree that you have opens more potential jobs or more potential doors. I'm going to tell you, there is one degree that opens all doors, and it is a law degree. So if you can get a law degree, if you have the capability, go get a law degree. You can do any job in the world with a law degree. Other than a law degree, my second recommendation is that you have a bachelor's degree of applied sciences. So I want sciences because I don't need arts necessarily in what we do, though I do value liberal arts uh, employees, but it will open more doors if you have a sciences degree and it will open more doors if it's an applied degree so you've had hands-on experience. After those two things, everything else to me is equal. When I interview people, everyone is equal if they don't have an applied sciences degree or a master's degree um, or a, a, a law degree. A law degree in our industry is golden. It can open every single door. Thank you so much for answering that question. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Michael, Tejas, and Sunil for answering uh, and for the great presentation and the knowledge shared with our global audiences. It was a pleasure to have you with us and we are looking for more and more sessions with you. Now, before we conclude the webinar, uh, would you like to give a message to our audiences? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Guys, it's not about your education. It's about engaging. The education is a requirement of getting in. How you are successful in our industry is to engage your community. Go join nonprofit cyber organizations like ISSA, SACA, ISC Squared, EC Council. Make sure you engage yourself with your community. Be seen. And I'm going to give you a, a, a change in a, a long term um, uh, wisdom we, uh, from a, a the history of uh, the modern world, we've often said it's um, it's who you know that makes you successful. It's who you know. I'm going to change that for you, that paradigm. It's who you help. I want you to go out there, get into your community, engage other people, engage organizations, engage nonprofits, and help them. Volunteer. Make a difference in your community and other people. Focus on helping other people succeed, and you will succeed. Yes. Yes, like everything that we've discussed here, I think this 
industry, these careers have um, endless limits and, and it's only growing. Sky is the limit for you guys. You all are entering this. If you are already not here, you are entering this at the right time. And like Michael said, involve yourselves, read up. Don't just get in for the getting a good job. Be passionate about it. We want to be on a continuous learning trajectory. Otherwise, you're going to leave this industry soon and miss out on the great work that is being done here. We need a much safer cyber world and people like you, great talents, great passion and continuous learners is required. And my 27 years in this field and I enjoyed every moment of it. So please consider cybersecurity as a career and, and contribute to the deeper cyber world. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you, C Council. Bye everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for the message to our audiences. Uh, now, before we end the session, I would like to announce our next cyber talk session that is Ethical Hacking Emerging Technologies that Require Red Teamers, which is scheduled for April 29, 2022. This session is an expert presentation by Rico Danielson, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer. To register for this session, please do go and visit our website www.eccu.edu slash cybertalks. The link is given in the chat section. Hope to see you all on April 29th. With this, we end our session. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you. 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 Th